get the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, here's what Free Agent do. We do cloud accounting for freelancers and micro businesses. I'll explain a bit more about what that means uh, during the next 20 minutes or so. So our vision is making businesses happier and more successful by putting them in control of their finances. Um, we listed on AIM in uh, November of last year, so it's only been about three months now. Um, you can tell I'm new to this. I still have the share price on my watch, so I don't know how, when that will stop. But uh, this is the history of the last uh, 10 years or so of the company. In fact, it'll be our 10th birthday uh, at the weekend, uh, which we'll be very much celebrating. So you can see how uh, annualised revenue has grown over the last 10 years. We're uh, projecting uh, about 8 point something uh, million in annualised revenue. It's grown about 35% year on year for the last couple of years. And you can also see the, how the team size has grown. We're about 120 people. We're based about a mile that way in Fountain Ridge in Edinburgh. Do come in and see us if you, uh, if you get a chance. It's a great office. Um, we listed, as I say, uh, on November the 16th. <coughs> the share price at the time was 84p. It's now <coughs> today 120, so it's about a market cap of about 48 million uh, pounds. Um, and I'm just going to talk a bit about our strategy. So um, for us, the clarity of what our strategy and our focus is is, is super important. There are three strategic levers that we are uh, pulling one, if you like. One is about delivering growth, and growth is super important for us. Delivering growth by focusing on UK <coughs> micro businesses and their accountants. I'll talk a bit more about that, what that means in a second. Secondly, into that market to offer a premium differentiated product experience that customers love, and we charge a premium price for that, which is great. And thirdly, as you might expect, to uh, build and maintain a high performing, happy, and collaborative team. And each one of those relies on the, the one that follows, if you like. Without that happy team, we're not going to be able to build great software and offer a great service. And without that, we're not going to deliver the growth. So these build very much on each other. I'm going to talk about the first two of those tonight. And um, uh, we can chat about the, other, uh, the last one another time, perhaps. OK, so why do we like this market segment? Well, there are, as it turns out, about 5.5 million businesses in the UK altogether. And what most people uh, don't realise is how skewed towards the very low end the distribution of businesses by size is. So this is business, uh, size in terms of numbers of employees on the x-axis and numbers of businesses on the y-axis. And so it turns out that 95% of all businesses have fewer than 10 employees. And in fact, 75% have none at all. So that is um, uh, self-employed and, and sole traders. So that's four to five million businesses. And these are freelancers and web designers and photographers and plumbers and aromatherapists and coffee shop owners who constitute about a third of all employment in the UK, despite their very small size, and about 18% of all private sector turnover in the UK. So a very significant economic force uh, and one that we're very proud to be supporting. Um, and it's a market that's growing. So this is the change since the year 2000 of businesses of various sizes. And you can see that businesses with no employees, the self-employed, um, up by 77% in that time compared to much smaller rises for businesses of other sizes. And what's uh, more reassuring about that, if anything for us, is how consistent that growth has been. So even through some periods of, shall we say, relative economic uncertainty, there is continued consistent growth in self-employment in the UK, which obviously um, hopefully bodes well for the future, whatever you think about uh, <laughs> economic prospects as a country. Um, I'll just talk about one other factor which is really uh, playing into our advantages here and this is, uh, you might have been reading more about this recently, HM Revenue and Customs agenda towards making tax digital. And so although we don't have final timings on this, there's an enormous amount of money being invested at HMRC to digitise all of their systems at the back end. And the commensurate responsibilities for businesses is that by 2020, in fact starting in 2018 for many businesses, nearly all businesses will be required to keep track of their tax affairs digitally and to report to HMRC quarterly with updates uh, of, uh, of their accounts. And so for the 50% of micro-businesses who currently use spreadsheets or even slightly frighteningly just paper to manage their finances, that's going to represent a very significant transition and one that will be very well placed to be supporting over the course of the next few years. So that represents, I think, a, gr a great opportunity for us. Um, and so that's the market and how it's shifting. Uh, let me talk a bit about our differentiation because it is, uh, is really important. Um, another chart, and this time 
Uh, again, size of business along the x-axis, but this time functional scope along the y-axis. And there's a market out there called Small Business Accounting Software, and um, you probably recognize uh, some or all of the names that are in that box there. And um, not much has changed in that market in the last 15 years, uh, apart from you used to go into PC World and buy it shrink-wrapped in a box, and now you subscribe for it online. But the, the scope of what these products do has tended to be pretty similar even through that fairly big transition. And so um, especially guys like Sage and QuickBooks have, have sort of been replicating their, their desktop products and just putting them online. And so when I say small business accounting software, I think you know, typically what they're aiming at is a market which starts at two or three employees perhaps, goes all the way up to perhaps 50 or 100 employees. There's a pretty broad range of businesses to want to appeal to. And as a result, these products stay fairly generic in scope. Uh, they have to be very flexible, but with that comes complexity. And generally speaking, um, you probably want a bookkeeper or an accountant to run it for you because they, are, they, are, they can be complicated. In trying to serve the very low end of the market, what these companies will tend to do is just take their mid-range product, cut out all the interesting features and give that to freelancers and say this is what you should have, which isn't particularly helpful. If you want to do something outside that, that well-known box, then well, if you want to do time tracking and invoicing because you're a service-based business, you can buy something else and you can perhaps glue it together. If you want to do payroll, then you need to buy something else. Uh, and if you want to do tax and compliance, you're, you're certainly buying something else. And by the time you get to specifically above about 10 employees in size, uh, tax and compliance and in fact payroll start to get very complicated very quickly. So you're into products like Iris and CCH. They are absolutely built for accountants and you can run BP on them. But equally, um, they're just too complicated for mere mortals like us to be able to understand. By contrast, we sort of sit orthogonally to all of that. So we are just about the micro end of the market. But because these businesses are simpler, we can build a complete end-to-end -end system. So everything from time tracking to tax return, all into one product and fully integrated together. And that makes a material difference to the level of engagement our customers have with the product, um, because it's all in one place and it's all done in much more real time. Um, so we do everything, including uh, projections of tax liabilities. We have a tax timeline where you can see all of a chronological list of all the deadlines that are coming up, how much the liability is uh, that you're going to have to pay. We also help our customers file their taxes, so self-employed. Um, we can fill in about 90% of the tax forms for them. They can top and tail the form and either file it for themselves or ask their accountant to collaborate with them and file it on their behalf. So very much an end-to-end -end solution. That, that makes a big difference because, uh, so for example, one of our customers said to us in the early days, um, I quite enjoyed putting my expenses in because I could watch my tax bill go down. So when you show people the mechanics of how that works and it feels like, you know, it's, it's a bit like a game, then you get people engaged on a daily basis with managing their accounts as opposed to trying to catch up every quarter or even at the end, uh, even at the, end of the year. And it's not as if us focusing on this part of the market is you know, us boxing us, ourselves into some little niche in the market. If I superimpose that distribution of business sizes, then you can see actually it's where the volume is in the market. It's where the market is mostly uh, categorised by non-consumption, so that people are using uh, spreadsheets and paper rather than other accounting systems to have to migrate them from. And it's also the part of the market that we think is going to be most uh, impacted by the digitisation of tax in the coming years. So we, we think we're pretty well placed there. And that strategy of focus on that part of the market seems to be working. We use Net Promoter Score to measure customer satisfaction. Um, I don't know if you've uh, seen this before, but um, it's, a, it's a great methodology for measuring satisfaction that works kind of across all industries, because it's a very simple methodology, and, the, and you simply ask your customers, how likely are you to recommend, say, free agent to a friend or colleague? Uh, on a scale of zero to 10, if they score you, score you zero to six, you call them a detractor. If they score you seven or eight, you call them passive. And if they score you nine or 10, they, you call them a promoter. And to get the net, promo <coughs> net promoter score, you just take the percentage of promoters, you ignore the passives, and you subtract the percentage of detractors. So um, the range of scores goes everything from plus 100 to minus 100. Um, industry averages vary quite widely. So um, telecoms and, and internet service providers in the UK average about zero. Uh, UK retail banking is about minus nine. Um, somebody told me the other day that Flybe was minus 74. <laughs> Um, I, can, I can quite believe it. These are the best performing companies. Uh, these are US benchmarks. These are the ones we can get for free. Uh, best performing companies last year in their respective categories. TurboTax, the best performing in software and apps with 57. The average in that category is 24. Apple uh, for the iPhone with 60. Amazon 
in e-commerce with 66 and JetBlue uh, Airways with 67. And, and our survey, we do this quarterly with a balanced subset of our direct customers uh, every quarter. And our uh, score in Q4 of last year was 77, which we're especially proud of. And you have to remember, this is, the, this is accounting software we're talking about. This is not the sexy end of the software market. So if we can be delighting people while they're doing their accounting, then we think we're onto something, um, something pretty good. So we're delighted about that. Um, the, the reason for that is we, we, we spend a lot of time and, uh, working on the product in particular. We have a very capable and very professional support function as well, but the product is really front and centre here and we invest an enormous amount uh, in our products to keep it ahead of where our competitors are. And I won't go into detail on, on, on any of these, but um, on the left-hand side is, are some of the things we have done over the past few years that um, arguably are not really what you would consider to be part of a, an accounting product in the traditional sense, but are very valuable for our customers. And on the right-hand side, um, uh, again, no promises on timelines or anything like this, but these are the kinds of things that we are working on to deliver even more value to our customers. And again, based on the sorts of things that you can only really deliver to, if you're focusing on micro-businesses as a segment, which is what our customers, uh, uh, what our uh, competitors certainly don't do. Now, I just wanted to talk about four uh, trends in technology which um, will have a, a, an influence on, on our success, success in the future that, um, that's probably worth, probably worth highlighting. Uh, the first one is SaaS software as a service, and we've been a software as a service business uh, since the very outset, from, from back in 2006. Um, it's all built as a single code base that's deployed across two, uh, uh, two, uh, um, uh, two, two data centers, but it's the same code base servi servicing all of that. And what we have seen over the past number of years is that the markets and investors in particular are understanding a lot more about the value of SaaS models. Specifically, if you can achieve high margins and low churn, then the customer base in itself is a very high value asset. And so we've got nine years worth of churn data on our customers. Churn is very low among our customers. It's about 1.4% a month, which equates to a customer life of about five and a half years. And if you think that the UK small business survival rate, uh, the five-year survival rate is about 41%, which is about 1.4% churn, most of our customers leave us because they are going back into employment or their business is winding down rather than they're moving. So once we've got them, we hang on to them. So the value of that customer base is very significant. And we, so we, uh, when we talk to investors, we tend to talk about, we tend to do a residual value analysis on just our current customer base. If just those customers stayed with us and we didn't add a single more customer, what would that pay out in terms of cash um, over the next number of years as the, as the customers churned out? And that really helps underpin our, our valuation. Um, the other thing about SaaS, which is great, is that we have a very clear understanding of how much it costs us to acquire a customer and how much that customer pays back in terms of lifetime margin. And if you can understand that in detail, because you've got enough volume going through uh, to be able to do that, then you can make some very clear decisions about where to focus customer acquisition investment, because you know exactly what you're going to get paid back in terms of in terms of customers. And we have two, bigger cha two big channels that are growing. One is customers come to us direct for a free trial. And the, the, the faster growing one is actually we sell to accountants. We then pass on the licenses to their customers uh, in bulk. Uh, and that's working really well. The second one is big data. Now, we have um, real-time business uh, information about all of our customers. And clearly, security and privacy are very important. And we but we use that data internally to understand customer behavior, to help optimize customer <coughs> journeys. But in the future, we think there's a lot of value in that, uh, not to sell arbitrarily to the highest bidder, but with our customers' consent to be able to share. And specifically, we think about using anonymized and aggregated data. So for example, to allow customers to benchmark themselves against other businesses. And so if you're a plumber in the south of England, then it would be useful to know how much other plumbers in your area are charging, what their margins are, um, what sort of things they buy, wh where they're spending their money, and so on. So a lot of potential there in, in using that data asset to deliver more value back to our customers. It's also a fantastic training set for machine learning. And so when we think about what else we could do for our customers, a lot of the things we want to do is be able to generate more insight into how their business could be running better, how others are doing. And so we want to be able to automate more of the accounting process and deliver more insight to customers by using the data we have on what's currently 50,000 customers to help people understand things better. And so there's a lot of work going on in our data team to understand where the value in using machine learning is uh, to, to help our customers uh, do, do, do better business, be more successful. 
And then finally, um, I'm just going to talk about convergence. And there's two things I really mean by this. And one is about um, the accounting services industry. And what we're seeing, especially with making tax digital on the horizon, is that accountants are starting to think about what does that mean for the profession? And every, every profession is being transformed by technology. And accountancy is no exception. And especially in our part of the market, we are absolutely stepping on the toes of some accountants who only deliver bookkeeping, accounting, reporting and compliance services. If that's all they do, then inevitably free agent will probably be automating most of that in the course of the next few years. And what they need to be doing is working out ways of delivering more value in terms of advisory services to businesses, helping them get started, coaching, tax planning and so on. So there's a lot of uh, change that's going to go on in the profession that we are really driving because we are really forcing accountants to come to terms with the idea that much of what they may have done in the past is going to be delivered by technology in the future. So that's changing a lot, but accountants are uh, actually just coming to terms with that and, and, uh, and, uh, and some of them are, are, are pretty positive about the opportunities of that. And then the second piece of convergence I'll talk about is really about banking. And so um, in the middle of January, we announced a, a, a new partnership with the Royal Bank of Scotland group. So RBS here and NatWest in the UK, in the uh, UK, in England. <coughs> currently still the UK we are, um, and um, whereby free agent is being rolled out across their customer bases, and they have three quarters of a million customers, uh, rolled out across their customer base, uh, effectively at, at no charge to those customers, uh, which obviously represents a very interesting opportunity for us to generate a lot of volume uh, in, that, in that banking channel. Um, now the quid pro quo from the bank's point of view is uh, uh, they, will be, they will be giving us bank data, transaction data, which we already do get through other means, but they'll be giving us bank data. So on a daily basis, we can keep people's accounts up to date, which is obviously drives engagement a lot um, and is very, uh, and is very uh, beneficial for customers. But the quid pro quo for the, the product being free is that data will be shared back to the bank as well. The banks see value in not only understanding their customers better, but clearly they want to be able to lend more to these kinds of businesses because they are politically uh, very much on the hook to do that, but find it very hard because they don't really understand how businesses are performing, especially in, in our part of the market. So we see that as the first sign, really, that banks in the UK, not just the challenger bank type, uh, type operations which are just spring up, but, but, but uh, you know, legacy retail banks, they don't come much more legacy than RBS, um, are really understanding that there is a significant change happening, which, which uh, was touched on earlier, in terms of both open banking um, data and in, ter and in terms of the payments infrastructure as well. And they're going to have to get ahead of that, otherwise they're going to start to lose customers to, to more nimble banks who are, who are delivering more value. So we sit in this sort of fintech space now where we're sort of in the, in the middle of potentially some interesting lending and uh, insight opportunities. But the hub of all of that has to be the accounting system because it's where all the data converges together uh, and where the, where the insight is generated from. Okay, that's, uh, I wanted to have a little bit more time for, for Q&A, so we've got a couple, couple more minutes. That's all, I have to, uh, that's all I have to say. Very happy to take any questions. Um, can you give us a little explanation about your business? Um, you know, turnover, the charges you make to, to customers? Yes, so uh, I had a slide, so we're doing about uh, just a bit over eight million pounds annualized turnover. So all of our revenue is recognized as monthly recurring revenue, right. and we're doing just a bit more than eight million pounds in recurring revenue. The charges uh, to direct customers um, are uh, 19 pounds if you're a sole trader a month, um, uh, 24 pounds if you're a partnership and 29 pounds if you're a limited company. Our accountant partners uh, will get discounts on that based on the scale. Of, uh, a lot less than Sage charge, is not it? So it's it's actually more. It's actually quite a bit more oh, than Sage charge. Sage yeah, for our, oh. so they have a product uh, Sage One, which doesn't do much, but it's very cheap. Um, and so I think there is, amongst those sort of historical uh, providers where their products are effectively commoditized because they don't do much, there's a sort of bit of a race to the bottom on price. But we manage to sustain our prices in the market. Yeah. Questions? Can I ask you a couple of questions? You're starting from the bottom of the market, moving up, and you've got established players like SAP that sit at the top of the market coming down. How do you defend yourself once the two of you start fighting over the same bit of the market? And the second question is, with your integration concept, how do you sit with the Information Commissioner on sharing people's data back yeah, and forward? Yeah, good, good question. So uh, I don't think... Um, there'll be a while before we are thinking, wow, we've really fully penetrated this micro-business market and it's time to find something else because we have at the moment 50,000 customers. There are 5 million businesses potentially we could be 
bring on board, and there's no reason why we shouldn't have a million or two. And so um, that's going to, you know, if, if we get to that point, that'll be a very high class problem to have, and we can, we can think about it. I think actually some of the ways that we think we'll grow is probably to look at a similar market but outside the UK, rather than thinking that we need to grow up market, because actually the numbers of businesses get small quite quickly, and of course they will pay more. Um, but what we don't want to do is make the product more complex. And so when we think about, well, sometimes businesses outgrow for agents, and we, um, we, we recommend other products. Actually, Zero is a great product if you're a 15-person business, um, but it's not the right product if you're a three-person business for agents, it's the right product. And so people outgrow us. And we don't want to worry about that, because if we did, we'd, we'd be building tools that really suit bigger businesses, and that would make our existing product much harder to use. And so we'd rather stick to our focus while there's still plenty of headroom in the market, and perhaps think geographically about where we might take the same idea to different places. And your second question was? Yes, so um, it's very importantly, we place some uh, constraints on what data is shared to the bank, and specifically, um, contact information um, in relation to customers and suppliers is withheld because it's not within our customers' gift to, to share that because it's considered to be personal data from the information commissioner's point of view. Everything else can be done with their consent, but that, but that can't be, so we constrain that. Question over there. Uh, you mentioned RBS. Is that an exclusive agreement you've got with them? No. And, and secondly, well, I didn't think it would be, but <laughs> and secondly, uh, you didn't say much about your P&L at all, did you? I didn't. I've got my CFO here, actually, Kath at the back, who can answer hard questions uh, on, on numbers. Um, so what we, what we can say is, well, I can, let, let me say this, and you can... Go on, put her on the spot, go yeah. on. <laughs> let me say this. So we don't release forecasts. Uh, of course we don't. Um, the analyst models that are out there have us um, coming back to breaking. Our first full year of profitability is year ending March 19. And in the meantime, we are making serious investments in both... Um, Accelerating customer acquisition, principally among accountancy practices where um, revenue growth is very strong, but also continuing to invest in the products and specifically to make the most of this making tax digital opportunity. And a lot of that's happening, in, in, uh, a lot of that's focused on mobile in particular because of the nature of many of these businesses coming into the market who aren't particularly technically savvy, technically savvy don't, like, don't like computers, but are very happy to you know, do stuff on their smartphone and that's what we're trying to focus on. Any other questions, anybody? Um, Promotion-wise, do where do you promote um, your services? In, in trade magazines? And um, so we have two, the web two very different models. So um, one is the direct customer model, which is, all, which is sort of normal digital techniques, uh, online advertising, a lot of content, we sponsor events and so on. Uh, which is very very low touch uh, and, and almost purely digital. And then the accountancy sales model is a very traditional enterprise sales model because we are, uh, accountants are buying 500 or 1,000 licenses. And so it's a very traditional sales team driving around the country in their shiny cars and face-to-face and -face meetings with accountants. Um, so two different, three different models. And then the banking channel layers another layer on top of that, but all the promotion work is done within the bank in that case, and we're just okay. bringing customers in. Uh, somebody else doing your sales for you is always nice, isn't yes, it? So, yeah. uh, any other questions, anybody? No, thank you very Great, much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.